honored to be able to once again bring the Word of God uh, to you this morning. And uh, as we do that, I want us to uh, think about the fact that everywhere you look, it seems like people have a different idea of, of what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, I'm sure it hasn't escaped your attention, but we're in an election year, and uh, in some settings, there is a sense that following Jesus means voting in a particular direction. Uh, it, there are other settings where y- you might be speaking to someone, and their idea about what following Jesus is all about really has to do with just doing good things and trying to follow the good examples of Jesus. If you uh, wander into a Catholic church, you might hear that following Jesus is all about keeping the sacraments. Or even in, in some uh, Bible teaching churches, you may, go, you may go in and be forgiven for uh, walking out with an understanding that following Jesus is just about praying a prayer to seal the deal. But it seems to me that as we're gathered in a place like this this morning, that it's appropriate that since many of us uh, would uh, express the fact that we are indeed followers of Jesus, that we should have a good understanding of exactly what that means and where better to go than back to the source Himself. And so, as I know you've been in this series looking at biblical discipleship, I'm going to pick that up again this morning, and I want to invite you to join me in the New Testament Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 14, if you have a copy of the Scriptures with you, we're going to be beginning in Luke 14, verse 25. As you grab your Bible and turn there, I should also let you know that you may want to buckle your seatbelts because for some of us there may be a little turbulence along the way. Luke 14, beginning in verse 25. What is required to follow Jesus? What does that look like? Well, here's what we learn. Now, great crowds accompanied Jesus, and He turned and He said to them, if anyone comes to Me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be My disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after Me cannot be My disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build, and he was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. As Jesus is speaking here to the crowds, what we see very clearly is that following Jesus is costly. It's costly. A disciple of Jesus is not simply someone who has jumped on the bandwagon or made a casual decision. Uh, Back in biblical times, it was not unusual for many different teachers of different sorts to have disciples. If you go back in history and you read about even some of the Greek philosophers, you'll discover that they had disciples. The rabbis within Judaism and the Pharisees had disciples. Even John the Baptist is described as having some disciples. And these disciples were often uh, young men who, uh, whose families paid for them to go and be under the tutelage of some renowned 
teacher. And they would often leave their own home. They would go and live with their teacher, or they would study under their teacher. And so there was a cost involved, but it was a financial cost, and it usually was setting them up well for the future. But Jesus here is calling to a a radically different type of discipleship. He takes that which was a familiar concept, and He transforms its understanding as He calls those who would follow Him, and that's what being a disciple is, is to follow after and learn from. Those who would follow after Him and learn from Him. He says this is a costly thing. He, he invites them not into a nice comfortable home, not into a, a, a nice contained classroom environment, but to walk with Him, to journey with Him, to live with Him. And He says that there's a cost and it's not, it's not a financial cost. There's, there's no tuition fees to be paid, but rather the cost that he calls to is something far more substantial. We have this statement here, which is troubling to us, and it ought to be troubling, as I think it was troubling to the original audience. And what we see is that truly following Jesus, being His disciple means that he must take priority over every relationship. Some of us kind of uh, uh, sat up straight and surprised when we read something like this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And initially, this may seem strange because this is the same Jesus who just a little bit earlier in the gospel account has told us that We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and love our neighbor as ourself. And of course, those two, the the, the loving in that way and hating would, would be utterly inconsistent, and Jesus is not being inconsistent here. Rather, He's using a rhetorical Uh, method. He is using something that we see on several other occasions in Scripture, and really it speaks of degrees of loyalty. He's saying, if, you, if anyone does not love their father, mother, sister, brother, wife, children, even self, less than they love me. Or, or in other words, if you don't hate those in comparison to the depth and extent of the love you have for me, you are not fit to be my disciple. Those who put any other relationship above Christ Himself need not apply. And this must have been staggering even back then as it is to us today. But, you know, it it seems really strange within our culture because this isn't the experience that most of us have had. In fact, many of us, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, and I hope that you are, that you've trusted Him for the life and salvation that He gives. If you have, uh, the likelihood is that most of us, when we came to faith in Christ, had some people in our lives who were really excited. Maybe you had some people in your life who had been praying for you for a long time, and when you trusted Christ as your Savior, that was a cause for great celebration. Maybe some of us also had some people in our life, and they're like, "Uh uh-oh, they're going to be really weird from here on out. But the point is that within our culture, for most of us, coming to Christ doesn't necessarily mean a break from our former relationships, but even in much of the world today. As we train pastors in remote regions of the world, and one of the regions that we work in is the Middle East, and and this is a big issue as we're training pastors as they're then going out and preaching the gospel and seeing people come to faith out of Islam. There's the great challenge of what do they do? Because in many places, to convert from Islam to Christianity can mean a death sentence. And they have to wrestle with the question, do they go in and and change their identification card because their driver's license has their religion on it? To change it from Muslim to Christian. And they have to wrestle with these things. How do they identify themselves with Christ? Or just this last week, I was talking to one of the pastors that we're working with in Myanmar, um, Pastor David, um, David Manna, and he uh, 
uh, the, was telling me about some of the challenges that, that they're facing there amidst the, the conflict and the unsettledness because of uh, really the civil war taking place in that country. Uh, but he, David, was, was formerly a high-ranking government official, uh, uh, made a lot of money, had a lot of power, a lot of authority within the government, and he came to faith in Christ. And when he came to faith in Christ, he was called into the office of one of his superiors, and he was told, unless you renounce this Jesus and turn back to Buddhism, you will be demoted and you will lose all of your authority within this office. And he saw that as being really a line in the, sta- in the sand, how he believed that God was calling him to take a stand for Christ, so he resigned his position, and he set his heart to begin to pastor the church. So we've been training and working with him. He's leading a, th- a thriving church now and seeing many Buddhists and animists come to faith in Christ. We praise God for that. But, but he was telling me how his own family then ostracized him as a result because they considered it to be such a shameful thing that he left that position of prestige. And this past week, as he was telling me about the challenge that he and his family are having, even of putting food on the table for his wife and children, he said, I don't regret the decision I made. I don't regret leaving that stuff behind because following Christ is of greater worth by far. But you know, it's not just in different places around the world as Jesus speaks of this priority of allegiance. This is also true for some of us, maybe on your high school campus or college campus, when, uh, when following Christ means that you are not following what your peers are doing, and that can sometimes leave us in a place where we feel painfully alone and isolated from those around us because we have chosen to stand with Christ. There is a cost. Following Jesus is not an invitation to an ice cream social. It is a costly, revolutionary calling that requires total allegiance. It's what biblical discipleship is. More than that, truly following Jesus, being His disciple, it means taking the path sometimes of suffering and self-denial and of persecution. And we see that as Jesus says, likewise, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And of course, whenever we think of bearing the cross, we think of how Jesus himself bore the cross on our behalf. We just sang about that. As he took on himself our sin, our debt, our death to die in our place. But to carry the cross is speaking of self-denial. It's talking about laying down self and taking up Christ. And that's a costly thing. In John's gospel, speaking to his disciples uh, shortly before Jesus would be betrayed and, and go to the cross, he reminds them in John chapter 15, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. The invitation to true biblical discipleship is one to lay down self, to lay down our own comfort, convenience, and reputation, and to pursue the things of Christ, and even in that, the hardships, and at times the suffering, and at times the persecution. Now, we don't necessarily choose those things. Nobody goes out saying, woohoo, persecution, bring it on. It's not what this is talking about, but there is a sense in which, though We hope it may not come to us. We stand ready in any situation at any time and any circumstance to identify ourselves with Jesus Christ, who is Savior and who is Lord. Often we face the struggle of wanting to fit in with others around us. But the call of biblical discipleship. The call to follow Jesus is not to fit in. It is to stand out in the midst of a dark world. Following Jesus is costly. 
It's not for the faint of heart. The Apostle Paul puts it this way when he uh, speaks to the Galatian church. He says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. There's that idea again of carrying, bearing the cross. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Or to the Corinthians, he says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. It's a costly call, but it is a call to live no longer for self, but instead for Him. What's more, as he continues here, we see that following Jesus requires us to count the cost if we are to finish the course. And he gives here for us two different illustrations. First of all, of uh, of somebody building a tower. And this tower was probably like a watchtower that would have been built on the edge of a property, maybe overlooking a vineyard or over fields to, to, to keep watch and keep the area secure. And he says, anybody with an ounce of common sense is going to sit down first, figure out how much it's going to cost, and whether they can afford it. And then, only if they can afford to do it, do they build the tower, because otherwise you start, and you're not able to finish, and everybody makes fun of you. Everybody who walks past will mock you. Some of you are aware that uh, about 16 years ago now, there was uh, a lot of buzz in the Chicago architectural world about this skyscraper they're going to build called the Chicago Spire. And uh, uh, they started work on it. They, they, they dug the, the enormous foundations and put all of the pylons in that are necessary for this kind of skyscraper. And then they went bankrupt. And for the past 16 years on the Chicago lakefront, there has been a colossal hole in the ground. Finally, after all these years, they've just decided they're going to fill this pit in and do something with this property. But every time you pass by there, you're reminded that they were not able to finish what they started. And Jesus used that, uses that example there that, that following Jesus requires that we count the cost. He gives another example of the king preparing for battle. A king doesn't go out against a much stronger enemy without figuring out if he can win the battle. And if he can't win, then he makes other arrangements. He sends and and, and, uh, uh, a delegation to sue for peace. When someone comes to follow Jesus, they need to count the cost. They need as best as they are able understand what it means. You know, the problem in a lot of the church, not only here in our nation, but in many places around the world, is that there, we've kind of in some respects been sold a bill of goods. It's not that the gospel is a bill of goods, but there's this message that goes out, and I see it in particular in regions across Africa. I'm going to be traveling to Tanzania on Thursday, and, uh, and there's a great problem there with the prosperity gospel. Uh, and, and it's a message that basically says Jesus can make your life better. Come to Jesus, and He'll make your life better. But it has no, ex- no expectation of repentance, no expectation that there would be any form of transformation in one's life. Just keep on doing what you're already doing and add Jesus. But the great problem with that is it is not the it is not biblical discipleship. It's not what the scriptures call followers of Christ to. And there are many who name the name of Christ, who treat him just like an appendage that they are happy to pin on when it is comfortable and convenient to themselves. My brother-in-law recently retired from uh, uh, the Navy as a, a naval aviator after serving for many years. And I remember when he was on his very first deployment years back that we were talking with his wife and asking, you know, how are things while he's away? And, and she was saying, it's, it's okay, it's difficult, but we knew that this was coming. She said, but it's interesting because I've been talking to some of the wives of some of the enlisted sailors, and they're mad. 
they're really upset and angry because the recruiters, the naval recruiters, told them that if, if you join the Navy, you don't have to go to sea if you don't want to. And she's like, they're in the Navy. What do they expect? And, you know, we laugh. And that, that really happened, by the way, but we laugh. But there's a, sort of, there's a sense in which there are many who, who come to Jesus, but with this idea of the fact that they don't have to go to sea. That, that there is no cost, that there is no expectation, that, that trusting Jesus as your Savior and Lord doesn't mean that there is anything that we need to give. No, Jesus calls to a radical, a costly discipleship, to a turning over of our allegiance to make Him the first, greatest, and only priority of life. G.K. Chesterton, a well-known author in his day and someone who actually uh, deeply influenced the writings of C.S. Lewis, once said, it is not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting. It is that it has been found difficult and left untried. I want you to think about that for a moment. Because, you see, sometimes we can play around at church and play around in our walk with Christ when it is convenient to us, we'll consider obedience. But when the cost gets too high, no thanks, that's not for me. Jesus says, unless you count the cost, you're not fit to be my disciple. You see, following Jesus, being His disciple is a journey. We don't have to, we don't have to know how to do it all when we first trust Christ. And, and what He's talking about here is not adding our works to salvation. Salvation is a free gift of God, but it will cost you everything. We must consider who it is that we're following, and we must declare that we trust Him to lead us and empower us, whatever may come. But here's the good news. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, though difficulty, trial, overwhelming at times, circumstances may come, God is faithful. And He who begins a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He enables His people to persevere to the end, to finish the tower. Friends, I don't know where we each are today. We live in a culture that is ever pursuing our own comfort, convenience, and reputation, but those are simply not hallmarks of the life of a disciple. Rather, we must lay our own pursuits at the altar of Christ. And yes, that means that we need to count the cost daily to do that. Those who follow Jesus must count the cost and make Him the number one priority of life. And then after giving these illustrations, he, clo- he brings this portion of his teaching to a close, and we, uh, we see that anything less than that, anything less than total allegiance is, is useless. See this in verse 33 through, through verse 35. Jesus, first of all, says that any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. It's a handing it over, not only a giving over of allegiance, but giving over of everything that would threaten His preeminence in our life. And I want you to notice in the short passage that we've looked at, three times He says, cannot be my disciple, cannot be my disciple, cannot be my disciple. Many people who are trying to get a crowd, they love to do whatever is necessary. They'll change and compromise the message in order to gather the crowd, but Jesus won't compromise. Jesus won't lessen it. It's not like, oh, I'd really, really like you to come, so let me just make the terms a little easier for you, brother. No. He calls us to count the cost because He alone is Lord, Savior, and God, and if we come to Him, we do not come negotiating. We come to Him in surrender. And He says, therefore, that salt is good, but if that salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no use for the soil or for the manure pile, but rather to be thrown away. 
Well, some of you will know that salt is actually a stable compound, so this seems very strange to us, the idea of salt losing its saltiness. Perhaps he's referring to the fact that here in the ancient Near East, they would gather um, um, some salt from uh, the area surrounding the Dead Sea, and they'd often mix it with gypsum and some other substances kind of into, uh, uh, into a compound that they would then put on the fields or use for di- various different purposes. But in the heat, the salt often evaporated off, and you were left with just the sludge of the other stuff that had no use, no benefit, no purpose, and so just would be thrown out. But the point that Jesus is making is abundantly clear. Salt that's not salty is useless. And a disciple that's not following is not a disciple. One who who claims to be a follower of Jesus and is not walking in submissive obedience to His Lordship is not good for the purpose. And so the call He makes is to a costly obedience. Friends, are you casually walking? As long as it's convenient for you to do so, but not really surrendering, counting the cost, or wanting to give anything of your own up for Him? What does it look like for you to walk in obedience to Christ where you are today? Be watchful, because if I'm honest, the thing that I struggle with the most as I wrestle with and consider this is not so much the idea of putting Jesus in first place above all else, but is the fact that the concerns of each day, the busyness of life, has a way of letting anything and everything wield its way into that position of priority. So there is a sense in which perhaps you, like me, we need to start again day after day, each and every morning, and saying, all to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. Once again, Lord, I put you in first place. Forgive me that I have put my finances, my family, my pursuits, my dreams above and before you. I don't want to do that anymore. Christ and Christ alone in first place. Maybe, maybe some of us are in a place today and we've never yet trusted Christ as Savior and we're still checking out this whole Jesus thing. And we're confused because we see some who seem to be really into Jesus and really serious in doing things and others who, who, who say that they're followers of Jesus, but it doesn't seem to make an impact on their lives. I just want to encourage you that, that Jesus stands ready to welcome you. Come to Him. Acknowledge that you're a sinner before a, a holy God. That is, that each of us have gone our own way instead of His. Each of us have lived for our own glory instead of His. But know that as you come to Jesus, the one who has paid for that sin, died in your place so that the penalty of that sin could be done away with removed from you, and you could be reconciled to a good and loving God. Know that coming to Him is not without cost. It is a turning your life over to Him that He might use you and do with you as He chooses. Maybe today you're in a place, and I would just encourage you, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, don't leave here today without talking with someone that you've seen up here at the front today, that you might learn how to take that step and become one of His disciples. While to follow Jesus as His disciple means counting the cost and laying down ourselves and following Him always and only as first priority, as Lord and Savior and Master, take heart at this. To do so is to know joy and delight and peace like no other. Oh, that our community around us, our family, our friends, our co-workers might see us who name the name of Jesus living in such a way that they see not so much us, but they see Christ through us. 
as we lay down ourselves and take him up and live that life in him that the Apostle Paul speaks of. Following Jesus means counting the cost. It means making him the first, only, and greatest priority of life. But when we consider again who this Jesus is, how could he ever be anything less? How could he ever be anything less? Would you pray with me? Our Lord and God, we thank you for the reminder of your word that to follow Christ is a costly calling. And so, Lord, here we are. We cry out, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. As best as we know how, we want to follow Jesus, making Him first in every area of our lives. Forgive us for often allowing other priorities, other pursuits, other relationships to take first place. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who reflect not only the new life and salvation that is available in Christ to a, a watching world, but that who know and experience the joy, the freedom, the delight that comes from walking in your ways. Lord, teach us to count the cost and walk in daily surrender to you. Forgive us for those times where we play at discipleship instead of walking ever only, all for you. Lord, would you be glorified in our lives that the world may see and come to know Christ, the only and glorious Savior, for we ask in his name. Amen.